Hello everyone, this is going to be a video about long run uh, supply curves given perfect competition that we will expect in three different industry settings. Um, but before we get into that, I wanted to do a little bit of a review. Um, I suppose this will serve as like kind of the bulk uh, of your reviewing for AP Microeconomics Exam Unit Exam 3. And so, first of all, I wanted to define perfect competition. We said, or the technical definition is that producers are price takers in perfect competition. So I gave you that example of the lemonade stand that Mr. Diaz, I don't like talking about myself in the third person, but I, Mr. Rivas, um, Ms. Flores, um, Mr. Piscina, Ms. Smith, all set up in the parking lot. Um, we set up different lemonade stands at a hot summer's day. And what it means to be a price taker is that we are going to adopt the price um, that whatever is set in the market, right? Let the forces of supply and demand do their invisible work. But I don't have any agency. And I don't know if I use that word correctly, but I, I can't set the price, right? Because if I jacked up the price, then everyone would just go to Mr. Rebus's or Ms. Smith's um, lemonade stand. So I can't, right? So I would expect the demand for my individual firms output to be perfectly elastic, right? A horizontal demand curve uh, with uh, zero slope, right? A horizontal demand curve. Um, now, that doesn't mean the market demand curve is perfectly elastic. In fact, we can expect a market demand curve to be um, relatively inelastic. Uh, maybe on a hot summer's day, uh, a lot of people are demanding a lot of lemonade, but um, in a perfectly competitive mar market, the feature of it is that firms are price takers and individual output is perfectly elastic. Or individual, the output of an individual firms is perfectly elastic. So that's an important distinction to make. Uh, what conditions lead to a perfectly elastic, um, or I'm sorry, not perfectly elastic demand curve, but a, a but perfect competition? Um, well, identical products, so I can't sell strawberry lemonade. Right, they have to be at completely identical products. There has to be full information about prices. Uh, I can't be, you know, hiding behind the gym trying to sell people lemonade, um, and Mr. Reba's in the front, and Mr. Reba's jacking up the price, um, and nobody can be able to um, realize that they're really getting a raw deal. There has to be, you know, transparency about prices, and I guess the third one kind of bleeds into the second one. There has to be low transaction costs. You have to be able to make decisions uh, that, you know. Um, aren't going to be significant enough or what I should say by this it shouldn't you know like you shouldn't have to climb up a hill or a mountain to to acquire Mr. Diaz's lemonade right because then that would defeat the purpose of you know us all um, uh, or that wouldn't be a perfectly competitive market right there has to be um, uh, low um, uh, transaction costs it shouldn't um, take an arm and a leg to be able to um, buy output from another firm or buy the product or, or service from another firm. So um, we are going to set the market and we're going to make an assumption about the market uh, so I can you know, develop these models graphically. Um, uh, and that assumption is going to be a big assumption that does a lot of work because as we can see, perfect competition is not a very realistic uh, market structure or market system. But as I've said before, we study extremes in economics in order to understand the range of possibility that exists between those extremes. So specifically, we're going to talk about perfect competition this week, or, um, or we've been talking about it last week, I should say. And then we're going to be talking about um, monopolies, so like the other end of the extreme, um, on the, wing at, the week after spring break. And so we can have a better understanding of the range of economic activity that exists between those extremes. OK, so when do firms in a perfectly competitive market decide to enter, exit or shut down? So we're going to assume perfect competition, and this means that the firm is a price taker. So we've been developing this model of short run cost curves um, for some time. So we can see the average total cost curve um, is initially downward sloping um, and then you know, it has a slope of zero um, and then um, it has a slope of zero specifically where the marginal cost curve uh, crosses the average total cost curve uh, and then um, becomes upward sloping and then average variable costs. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be initially downward sloping, but it is in this example. And then we see it um, become upward sloping 
this is not me doing a good job of crossing the marginal cost curve at the minimum point, but in theory, it crosses the marginal cost curve at the minimum point and then begins to catch the average total cost curve. And the distance between these are is the average fixed cost. And if we actually took the average fixed cost, um, sorry, I'm trying to review for the material that you need to know for the exam as well. So you can go ahead and skip over this if this is like, okay, Mr. Diaz, you say this all the time, shut up, then skip, use the timestamps, move forward. Okay, but uh, we said in the short run, uh, remember we um, you know, talked about the production in the short run, and we said in the short run we're going to have a fixed input and a variable input. In the long run, everything's variable, meaning it can be changeable. Uh, we can get rid of um, you know, input in the factor of production, but the technical definition of the short run, we can't give a time period because the short run for different firms and different industries is going to be different, but it is um, the period in which one input in the factor of production is fixed. It makes more sense to hold capital fix, uh, and one way you can think about capital in a uh, coffee shop would be like the, um, maybe you locked in a lease for like a coffee shop, right? That would be example of like capital, like a, a cost associated with capital. You're locked in for the year, so you're you're stuck with that cost. Um, um, it's essentially a, a sunk cost in the short run, but a variable, uh, or I probably shouldn't say that because I don't want you to get sunk cost or not that, that thing. Sorry, as you did my my Greek economics teacher is texting me. Please don't kill me. Um, I think I said this, but if my micro, I meant to say if my microeconomics is watching this. Don't kill me. My microeconomics professor, I should say. Um, I wonder how he's doing. I don't think he's still at Georgetown. But um, anyways. So this model um, also tells us a story. It tells us a story because the um, average total cost curve and average variable cost curve um, and the marginal cost curve are curves, right? And so think back to your algebra two days, think back to your pre-calculus day. What do curves tell us? Well, curves, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, if you've taken calculus, you know that to calculate the slope of a curve um, or the slope of a curve well, you need to derivative. You, you use the concept of derivatives to calculate the slope of a curve at a point. But we can think about the slope of a curve is constantly changing, right? It changes, right? At each point, right? Slope of a curve is changing, right? So it's not a constant rate of change in the same way that lines are, right? And so that's significant. Um, and then we can also see, um, so we know that, um, that these cost curves, right, are, you know, there's their curves, and that, that means that the um, cost associated with production of coffee is not constant, right? Uh, it's, it's not going to have a constant rate of change. There's no, it's, the, these aren't, these aren't straight lines, right? There's no, um, you know, constant rate of change. They're curves, right? Um, but we also see that initially the ATC curve is downward sloping and then it becomes upward sloping. Um, that's because fixed cost, remember, uh, gets divided over increasing amounts of output. The ABC curve, um, you know, is upward sloping. It doesn't have to start off as downward sloping, but in this case it is. And the marginal cost curve, we've said this over and over again, um, that we can actually think about the marginal cost curve um, as you know, divide it up and we can see this like umbrella handle part where it, the marginal cost curve is initially downward sloping reflects this idea that diminishing marginal product hasn't kicked in yet. So initially we might have increasing marginal returns. And I'll define that in the description. I'll put those description definitions in the description and then um, where the slope of the curve were the curve becomes upward sloping, um, we have diminishing marginal returns, and that happens because of diminishing marginal product. Um, remember we talked about, uh, oh, now I have to review the concept of marginal. Marginal is additional twice. Think of that, it's gonna help you remember it. So diminishing marginal product reflects the um, 
idea that the additional product from an additional unit of labor is going to diminish at some point in the short run. And the idea is like, OK, yeah, maybe you can expand output um, by adding another barista, right? And you can add a third barista. But at some point, you should expect diminishing marginal product. Um, maybe it, it kicks in right away. It could be that second barista. Um, and you experience diminishing marginal product, meaning the additional product from adding that additional labor is smaller than the previous product of the uh, that came from that additional labor. Um, maybe it kicks in right away or came from that first labor. Maybe it kicks in right away. In this case, we don't have this little umbrella handle thing, or maybe it kicks in a little bit later and then we eventually get it. And as soon as it kicks in, um, we should expect an increasing marginal cost curve, which reflects Diminishing marginal returns and diminishing marginal returns happens because of diminishing marginal product of labor. It doesn't have to be a labor, but it makes more sense to hold labor fixed in the short run. So we can see these cost curves, memorize the shapes, um, but know the logic behind them. That's what's really important about this. And we're going to say we're going to assume perfect competition. I wrote it right here. I wrote this assumption here because I want you to think about this. Um, I, I, I want you to get into your mind that you know, this model that we're going to be building, these series of models that we're going to be building assumes perfect competition. And then we can see um, also that the price, uh, I put four different price points. The firm is not going to have an influence on these price points. They're going to be price takers. So this is going to mean that the marginal revenue curve, the additional revenue from sale of an additional unit of output or additional cup of coffee is going to be equal to price. And think about it, right? Because if price is a constant, there's nothing you can do. You can't discriminate against people. Then your marginal revenue curve is going to be um, that constant, right? So if it's five dollars, then your marginal revenue curve is going to be five dollars because it doesn't matter how many additional units you sell. You're always going to have that same amount of revenue. And this is a good reminder to know that revenue equals price times quantity. We've talked about tax re tax revenue before, which is the price of the tax times the quantity. If that tax is a per unit tax. Well, marginal revenue reflects this. Right, price times quantity sold. Or marginal revenue is not price times quantity sold. Revenue is price times quantity sold. Marginal revenue is the additional revenue from additional unit of output. And we can also say that this represents average revenue as well. Well, if it's a constant, um, right? This is going to also be the average revenue curve. So um, what else do I need? Oh, and this is also going to be the demand curve, right? We've already talked about the demand being perfectly elastic um, at each price point, or not at each price point. The demand for a um, firm's Output is going to be perfectly elastic, so it's, it makes sense that the demand curve is going to be actually here as well. So this is going to be demand, average revenue, marginal revenue, and price. And then we said the profit maximizing rule I showed you in tables. This is where marginal revenue equals marginal cost, which represents here. Marginal revenue equals marginal cost, um, and profits equals revenue minus cost. And then I put an important star here. Remember, we're talking about economic costs. I'll put the distinction between economic and accounting costs in the description because I don't want to make this video run too long. And then pi, which I'm going to say is just going to be a stand in for profits in economics. We represent profits as pi. Pi divided by Q is going to be the average or the per unit profit is going to be a per unit revenue minus per unit costs. So it would actually be your profit maximizing place. So marginal revenue equals marginal costs. Go all the way down to the cost curve, right? So go to the ATC curve. So that distance between those two points is going to be your per unit profits. Um, and then, so this also helps us kind of realize algebraically why it makes sense, right? We could just multiply by Q to get profits. And to multiply by Q, um, like we have to see the quantity sold, it would allow us to realize that, I, su I suppose, put an algebra to. I probably shouldn't use that term, but at this price point, all of this would be revenue. So go to the intersection of marginal revenue and marginal cost, go down to the ATC curve and across, that's revenue. 
everyone get that? At price point two, however, we are breaking even. We have normal profits, meaning uh, we've discussed this distinction between accounting and economic profits. It doesn't necessarily mean a bad thing. Uh, that just means your next best alternative, you would achieve the same amount of profits. Because remember that when we're talking about economic costs and economic profits in this class, we're also taking into account implicit costs or opportunity costs. So at P2, we have normal profits. At P3, which is less than average total costs, we're going to stay operating in the short run and then exit in the long run. Um, so the way that you can think about PT is that, or P3, is that you're in a scenario in which um, you can pay your off your variable costs and it is preferable to stay open because there's nothing you can do. Um, you're not going to make enough to pay off your fixed costs, but um, I can show you a math example later about that shows that you're better off staying open uh, if, you're if your uh, marginal revenue curve is between ATC and ABC than shutting down. Um, but you are going to eventually exit in the long run. So meaning as soon as you're able to break that lease or sell that building, you will sell it. And then at P4, when price is lower than average variable cost, you're going to shut down in the short run and exit in the long run. All right, so let's get into the long run competition model. Oh, did I show? So to find the area of losses, you would do the same thing. Um, so for like P3 to find the losses, you would go from the intersection of marginal revenue to marginal costs, all the way up to the ATC curve. And then this area right here represents losses. And it works. Okay, moving on. Now we're getting into long run competition. So this is an interesting model that we've developed in this class before. And I'm going to, this assumption is critical and this should be at the back of your mind. We're assuming perfect competition. We're assuming these unrealistic market conditions that I've just outlined earlier. Um, so in this scenario, um, I want you to, uh, or the, this model is interesting that we're developing because we're assuming perfect competition. Um, and then we are going to relate the short run cost curves of an individual firm to uh, the market supply and demand curves to tell a t story about the long run, right? So it's quite fascinating, uh, really, um, that we are able to do this graphically. Uh, but essentially, we tell stories with economic models, right? And very important stories, I should say so myself. So in this example, and I know I'm not an idiot, the electric car market is not reflective of, perfect com of a perfectly competitive market, but it was cool because I think it allows us to think like some of the, I suppose, directional truths that we can arrive at with this model, you know, apply to Tesla and the electric car market for sure. Um, if not this idea that, you know, we'll eventually end up at zero economic profits, but certainly this idea, which we'll get to at, uh, um, uh, later, that um, with profits, we should expect more market entry. And this increased market entry is going to force, force firms to uh, produce at the cost minimizing point. Um, but we can see right here um, in P1, I drew the profit that we would expect Tesla to experience from electric cars. We saw videos of other electric car makers wanting to enter the Tesla market, and then we could see right here the market for electric cars. Um, then, uh, critically, um, we said, or I'm sorry, this is the original supply curve for the for the market for electric cars right here at this price point we can see tesla has profits then we said we would represent or uh, we would expect a shift in the supply curve to the right um right here we would expect a shift in the supply curve to the right to represent more firms entering the market because they want some of that profit they want some of that money and so we would expect a new equilibrium point this would be p2 and this new price point is going to be um, the tangent of like the minimum point of the ETC curve. And it, essentially what this reflects is that um, in a scenario in which there are profits, right, to be made, 
then more firms will enter in a perfectly competitive market and drive the long run profits to economic profits will be zero in the long run. So firms enter for profits and they can exit when they experience losses. And so if Tesla started experiencing losses, right, we would just show this by like a leftward shift in supply and we would expect um, in this um, model that the long run, um, that in the long run um, we're arriving at a price point that is the tangent of the cost minimizing point of the average total cost curve, or just basically at the bottom right of this this curve right so zero economic profits in the in the long run this is a very powerful model because it also allows us to think about the long run supply curve which i drew here and so essentially it says that the long run supply curve assuming there's no change in costs and we're going to see that this is going to be an added assumption that i made but i didn't tell you about it but now i just told you about it but um the long run supply curve is going to be perfectly elastic, right? So it's going to be right here. And so that's interesting uh, because it tells us in the long run, uh, despite output, right? Despite output, um, we should expect, um, um, despite changes in output, I should say, here you can see that we're getting, you know, expanded output in the market. We should expect um, entry or exit into the market. Um, and we also make another assumption like this firm is identical to other, you know, perfectly competitive firms. A lot of assumptions we're making, but um, we're saying that we should expect um, um, the price to be at the cost minimizing point. So what is the big idea behind this? Well, um, putting the perfect comp perfectly competitive model aside, you know, we kind of intuitively realize that if there's profits to be made, more firms will enter the market. But a really fascinating thing or feature um, that or truth or directional truth that we're allowed to arrive at by looking at this model is that um, increased competition is going to first force or push firms to produce at their cost minimizing points. Right, it's going to push firms to firms to produce at their cost minimizing points, which is obviously right here. So that's fascinating, right? That's a fascinating idea. Um, that, you know, we can realize um, by making assumptions about the market dynamics that is granted very extreme, um, but certainly we would expect with increasing competition, um, you know, cost minimization to, to take place over the long run. Or price to be driven to the cost minimization point of a firm. But I added an extra assumption to this, and I haven't told you what that assumption is. And that assumption is constant uh, cost industry. So this is the additional assumption that I made. And so a cost, constant cost industry, I'm going to wheel you over here so you can see what the cost <laughs> industry is. So a constant or uh, an uh, increase in cost industry uh, is an industry that experiences increases in average production costs as industry output increases perhaps because input prices are, are bid upward by increasing demand. So example would be automobile production that uses large amounts of steel production. And so the, we assumed constant cost industry. And so we're going to see, we're going to basically set the perfectly competitive market to three different settings, right? A constant cost industry, a decreasing cost industry, and an increasing cost industry. So I added an extra assumption uh, that I am just now telling you about um, to come up with the long run supply curve right here. And this is a constant cost industry. But there are certain industries where we would expect um, as output increases in that industry that the cost curves will shift or they will move um, or um, even decreasing cost industries. So let's think about it intuitively, right? So if you want to produce more, so you want to produce a greater quantity of Q, you know, 
you might also drive up the price of those inputs in the factors of production, right? So if you want more laborers, then there's going to be, you know, a certain to attract more laborers, you might need to like raise your wage or raise the price of labor. And so that's an, reflects an increase in cost industry, right? Um, your input costs are getting more and more expensive. Maybe if you're in the car producing business, your input costs of steel get more and more expensive. As more firms enter the market, there's increased demand for steel that's going to drive the price of steel up. And therefore you would expect as more firms enter the market, your costs increase, right? And so this is going to have a very interesting sort of, um, um, or not interesting, but in an increasing cost industry, we would expect an upward sloping supply curve. And I'm going to show you graphically using these two models over here, um, how our, our, the intuition, or I guess the idea behind an upward sloping supply curve in a constant cost, or an increasing cost industry. We already did cost, in cost industry. And finally, the last sort of dial and the last sort of setting is the decreasing cost industry. And we experienced decreasing costs. Um, our cost industry experiences decreasing average production costs as industry output increases. So think about economies of scale, people, you know, sort of having different learning curves and stuff like that. Okay, so now we're going to go to the back of the room right here. Okay, is that good? Yes. So I'm going to work on this board. And so right here, I'm going to show you an example of an increasing cost industry. I think it's reasonable to suspect that there are certain production dynamics that suggest that the electric vehicle market might be an increasing cost industry or it could be a decreasing cost industry. Um, so I'm going to say, I'm just going to say this is Tesla. And I'm going to make the critical assumption again, right? All of this is assuming perfect competition. We're setting an extreme assumption about the market characteristics, right? And then we're going to say, or we're making an extreme assumption about the market characteristics. This is the market for electric vehicles. And the same idea holds. We're using the market supply and demand curves in the short run to uh, with the cost curves associated with and the revenue curves associated with um, an individual firm to tell us a story about the long run, right? And so here, I'm just going to draw the average total cost curve, ATC. Remember, your marginal cost curve is at the minimum point of the ATC. It crosses the marginal cost curve. And then the market for electric vehicles, because I know I'm going to have this in equilibrium first, so the story that I tell you is, you know, not you know, overly complicated with shifts and stuff like that. I'm going to pretend initially that the market is in equilibrium, so at P1, and that there's zero economic profit. So this reflects long run equilibrium because we expect um, firms to enter and exit the market as there's profits to be had or losses to be incurred. They want to enter and exit the market eventually. And in the long run, we expect in a perfectly competitive world for profits, economic profits to be zero. So we're in long run equilibrium. However, we can also imagine a scenario in which I'm going to shock demand, right? So people start becoming more conscious about the role of uh, carbon combustion engines. Or they want to reduce their carbon footprint because of climate change, all these other sorts of things. Or they think Tesla's, or, or not just Tesla's, right? Because they have to be identical products. So all electric cars are a lot cooler than combustion engine cars, and so there's a leftward or a rightward shift in demand, right? And we can see how this is going to have an immediate effect on the market. So our P2 and our quantity is going to increase, and we can see here that in the short run, right, um, Tesla's or an identical firm. Um, is going to have a lot of profits, right? So we would go down to the intersection of this new price point, which reflects marginal revenue, all the way down to ATC, and that would reflect profits. So they went from zero economic profits to quite a bit of economic profits, right? Everyone can see that intuitively. And then what we should expect is that more firms will enter the market if there's profits to be had. And so 
I'm going to go ahead and draw this as a rightward shift in the supply curve. I'm going to be very careful because I'm going to tell a very specific story. Right, so I know the story that I'm going to tell. And there's other ways that you can tell this story. So don't think like you have to know the whole story before you're drawing these graphs, right? Like don't think like, oh, I'm going to arrive at the truth eventually. No, you have to know the whole story before you're drawing these graphs. Um, and so specifically, um, this is, I suppose, not, not quite happening simultaneously, but as more firms are entering the market, the input prices in the production of Teslas, let's say labor increases um, for people that want to manufacture electric vehicles, um, all sorts of things are taking place, then the way that we would show this, right, is we would show it as an upward shift. Well, let me show it as an upward shift in the average total cost curve. I don't know why. And then an upward shift in the marginal cost curve. So sort of like marginal cost two. This will collect ATC2, right? Because uh, the inputs in the factors of production are the inputs in production are becoming more expensive, right? Um, and then I'm going to assume, right? I drew this curve with the kind of rough estimate that it would, yeah. So you know, it might take a while, right? It might take some curve shifting, but you have to draw it with the intention that, you know, we're going to be in long run equilibrium, right? Long run equilibrium takes place at the minimum point of the average total cost curves, right? We can see that. And now we can see that the long run supply curve, right? The long run supply curve is going to increase or it's going to be upward sloping in an increasing cost industry, right? Actually, let me draw that another cut. Use it as red, right? And the way that we would do this is we would go to the equilibrium long run points, right? The cost minimizing points for this ATC curve one and the cost minimizing point for that ATC curve two and go to those equilibrium points that we see and then just draw a line through them. And we see that the long run supply curve is upward something. Pretty cool, huh? A lot of little little um, math. Now, when you're drawing this, you can also draw the reverse, right? Um, and you would still see an upward sloping supply curve. So presumably maybe Tesla is experiencing losses. There's different types of settings, but you're still going to you know, be able to see an upward sloping supply curve. This is the key idea that you want from this, that your long run supply curve is upward sloping. Now we're going to assume a perfect competition again in an industry of decreasing a decreasing cost industry we're going to make the assumption of perfect competition that's critical um it's reasonable to suspect that there are some dynamics i don't really care um to be honest about car production i know that it seems like i'm an elon musk fan because we've been talking about tesla for a while but i really just don't care that but um you know, I suppose there are some dynamics in the electric car vehicle market that may mean that it could be in a decreasing cost industry or an increasing cost industry. So decreasing cost industries, you know, usually occur with economies of scale. So specifically, maybe um, I'm watching the documentary um, called American Factory on Netflix. It's super fascinating. I highly recommend it. But it's maybe people experience a learning curve. I see how I'm drawing this with intention because I'm drawing it in long run equilibrium. But people may experience a learning curve in the sense in a decreasing cost industry. Maybe with expanded output, they get better at production and maybe costs are driven down in a decreasing cost industry. So here's P1. See how I drew this with intention? P1 here. So it's in long run equilibrium. Now, same idea, I'm going to shock the demand for Teslas or demand for the market for electric vehicles. We're assuming perfect competition, new price point, more profits, right? More profits in the short run, greater output. Now, what we'd expect actually 
is in a decreasing cost industry, more firms are going to be in the market, which I will show again as a rightward shift in the supply curve. This is actually going to have to be further. Probably going to be steeper, right? See how I'm drawing this with intention? Rightward shift in the supply curve. And now, the reason why I drew this with intention is because I made the assumption marginal cost two, average total cost two. It's kind of bad, but you get the idea that actually price falls further, right? So maybe consumers are better off as quantity expands, which is kind of like the story tells you in a decreasing cost industry, you know, for the consumer welfare, you want price to fall further, which it does, and it's quantity sold expands, um, which is good for you. There's still zero economic profits because this is the long run equilibrium. Of course, in the short run, there's all people making profits. Um, and this allows us to come up with the long run supply curve for a market industry characterized by decreasing costs. Same idea, right? What's the equilibrium point right here, right? Uh, right here, where's the previous equilibrium point? Right here, draw a line through it. We see that the long run supply curve for a decreasing cost industry is downward slope. Interesting, right? So I know some of you are like, what the heck, Mr. Kias, you said the supply curve is upward sloping. Yes, I said in the short run, it's upward sloping. And think about it. The reason why we have an upward sloping supply curve, we've talked about this, is because of the marginal cost curve. In fact, in the short run, your marginal cost curve is your supply curve, right? The reason why you as a producer are going to demand higher prices as the more output you produce generally is because your marginal cost is increasing, right? And the reason your marginal cost is increasing is because you experience diminishing marginal returns. And the reason you have experienced diminishing marginal returns is because you have uh, diminishing marginal product, right, in the short run, right? All these interesting features and ideas connecting together, right? But in the long run, if your costs are falling, there's your supply curve, there's no way you're going to demand, you know, um, a greater price, right? Because we can see prices falling in this decreasing cost industry, output is increasing, and so we would have a negatively sloped long run supply curve and a decreasing cost industry. 